Welcome to our segment on the Milky Way. In this segment, we'll go over our current understanding about the structure and size of the Milky Way as a whole and our place in it. We'll examine the galactic center with its supermassive black hole. We'll go a little deeper into the nature of a black hole. We'll explore the galactic disk with its spiral arms. And we'll cover the latest information on the galactic halo. And, as usual, we'll discuss how we came to know these things from our viewpoint deep inside the galaxy itself. On January 1st, 1990, from its orbit around the Earth, the Goddard Space Flight Center's Cosmic Background Explorer created this edge-on view of our Milky Way galaxy in infrared light. Here's a newer inside image of our galaxy. In fact, it's the most detailed map ever made. It was released in 2018 by Gaia, the European Space Agency spacecraft, that recorded the position and brightness of 1.7 billion stars, as well as the parallax, proper motion, and color of more than 1.3 billion stars. The map shows the density of stars in each portion of the sky. The galaxy has a center with a central bulge, a disk of rotating stars and dust, and a halo without dust clouds and peppered with globular star clusters. The disk is at least 100,000 light years in diameter, and the halo is much larger than that. We'll go into each of these galaxy components, starting with the galactic center. We'll cover how images like these are created from inside the galaxy, and how impossible it is to get an image from outside the galaxy, later on in this segment. The world's great space observatories, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the Chandra X-ray Observatory have collaborated to produce this unprecedented look at the central region of our galaxy. Hubble documented vast arcs of gas heated by stellar winds from very large stars. Spitzer's infrared picked up the pervasive heat signals of all these stars. And Chandra detected X-ray sources from ultra-dense neutron stars and small black holes. Together they produced this spectacular image. The central object in the Milky Way is known as Sagittarius A star, or Sag A star for short. It is surrounded by so many stars and gas and dust that it is almost impossible to see. Teams of astronomers and astrophysicists have been working on understanding Sagittarius A star for over 25 years. The UCLA Galactic Center Group, along with the Keck Observatory on top of the Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii, and the European Southern Observatory and its array of very large telescopes in Chile, and the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany, and many others have made dramatic progress in advancing our understanding of this critically important part of our galaxy. After decades of careful observations, the speeds and orbits of around 45 stars around Sag A star have been calculated. This enabled measuring the precise location of the point they are all orbiting around. The measured orbits also identified the gravitational pull from this point, which in turn gave us its mass at 4 million times the mass of our Sun. But when we look at this point, we don't see anything. This was strong evidence that Sag A star was a black hole, because stars are known to be unstable at much smaller masses. The star S2 is of particular interest, because it passes closer to Sag A star than any other. It's a single main sequence star with 10 to 15 times the mass of our Sun. Observations of the star 
showed that its orbit took it to within 20 light hours of Sagittarius A star in 2002 without bumping into anything. That puts Sag A star's 4 million sun mass into a very small place. For many astrophysicists, this constituted proof that it was indeed a supermassive black hole. But others pointed out that an extremely dense dim star cluster could produce these results. But if Sag A star were a cluster, S2's orbit would wobble. It did not wobble. This was the final proof point. 500 years after Copernicus put the Sun at the center of our solar system, this team identified Sagittarius A star as a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. But we weren't done with S2. Its orbital period is 16 years. Following the 2002 passing, a major effort was mounted to upgrade ESO's Very Large Telescope Array to enable the precision needed to reveal the true geometry of space and time near this object and test Einstein's theory of general relativity. These new instruments followed S2 very closely. At the start of 2018, it was accelerating towards Sag A star, reaching relativistic speeds. On May 19th, it reached the closest approach, pericenter. At that point, it was traveling at 7,650 kilometers per second or 4,753 miles per second. That's almost 3% of the speed of light. Its distance from the black hole was just 18 billion kilometers, or 11 billion miles. That's only 120 times our distance from the sun. The separation on the sky between the two points was just 15 milliarc seconds. It was also reddening in color as the black hole's gravitational field stretched its light to longer wavelengths. The color change in this illustration is exaggerated for effect. The actual reddening is quite small and would not be visible to the naked eye. S2's velocity changes close to the black hole were in excellent agreement with the predictions of general relativity. In addition, the change in the light wavelength agreed precisely with what Einstein's theory predicted. But understanding what is happening this far away is always prone to errors. I remember when we thought there was a gas cloud, G2, that would be entering the black hole in 2014. This never materialized. In our current case, some astronomers point out that massive non-luminous objects such as stellar mass black holes, might be present and could affect the orbital dynamics of S2. More research is needed to rule out this possibility. Here's a full dome illustration that shows how Sag A star might look to viewers on a planet orbiting S2 as it orbits the black hole. We'll cover black holes and why our supermassive black hole might look like this. But first, we'll cover how the ESO Very Large Telescope actually measured the minute distances associated with S2 and Sag A star, 26,000 light years away. The Hubble Space Telescope can resolve angles on the sky as small as 50 milliarc seconds. The angular distance between S2 and Sag A star at Paris Center was just 15 milliarc seconds. That's 42 billionths of one degree and three times smaller than Hubble can resolve. To follow S2 as closely as they did, astronomers had to use a stellar interferometer. These kinds of telescopes can resolve images 30 to 40 times smaller than optical telescopes. This makes them extremely important tools for studying the galactic center, as well as exoplanets. They can even resolve sunspots on nearby stars. So to understand how we know how close S2 got to Sag A star, we need to understand how these stellar interferometer telescopes work. 
in the Speed of Light chapter of the How Fast Is It video book. We covered the Michelson interferometer used to measure minute distances in the lab. Interferometers can measure distances on the order of a few nanometers. Michelson and Morley used it to show that the speed of light was a constant. In order to create light interference, Michelson illuminated the interferometer with fully coherent light. Coherent light has a common frequency and phase. It always produces interference patterns on the far side of a double slit. Fully coherent light, like the kind that lasers create, will produce regions of fully destructive interference. That is, the dark regions have no light falling on them at all. Partially coherent light will produce regions of partially destructive interference, meaning some light falls in the dark regions. And incoherent light will not produce interference patterns at all. We find in nature that waves can start out as incoherent and become partially coherent as they spread out. Watch how these ducks start with a chaotic mix of water waves as they enter the pond. But as the waves move out, they become quite orderly. This is a geometrical effect. The further away one travels from the source, the less significant the distance between the individual wave generators becomes. A point source for starlight would produce coherent light, and at any distance from the source, the light would create interference patterns. But there are no point sources in nature. Stars have a diameter on the sky. An extended thermal light source would start out with incoherent light. But as the light moves away from the source, its coherence increases, just like with the ducks on the pond. It is fascinating to note that incoherent light waves created by excited atoms in stars 20 billion kilometers apart can travel for 26,000 years and still carry the remnants of that starting condition. A large enough stellar interferometer can use the visibility dimming of the interference pattern created by the light to detect the original star separation. See how the amount the image fades is greater the further apart the two stars are. The math involved was developed independently by Dutch physicist P. H. van Sittert in 1934 and F. Zernike in 1939. It's known as the van Sittert-Zernike theorem.